was going to talk about has already been covered. <laughs> really, dancing in the dark, enlightenment. I want to give a shout out to my Zen, my Sangha, my <laughs> Dharma brothers and sisters. So if you want okay, to know, Joe. thank you. <laughs> if you want to know about embodiment, being able to stand still and dance, 38 West Lake, Oak Park Avenue, Zen Life and Meditation Center. That place changed my life. I can sit still and I can dance with the best of them now. So about my story, it actually is called Dancing in the Dark. However, I have a subtitle and that is Take it to the max. So I'm going to give it a minute while I ground my feet into the earth. I want to catch my breath, find my voice, and gather my thoughts. So at the Zen Center, we call this grounded, aware presence. And I am trying to do that tonight. So, I was a college professor for 38 years. I taught art. So I'm very aware of visual signifiers. So I'm gonna point out that my feet are bare because that's how you have to dance. I'm wearing a skirt and a scarf because I like the feel of fabric. And I'm here to tell you, a girly girl kind of woman can be a down to the mat, hardcore feminist. So I'm wearing this hat because my stories are dedicated to Leonard Cohen. Leonard is the master to my mistress of ceremonies. Now let's get this up front about the hat. Leonard Cohen, poet, writer, sage, prophet, philosopher, scholar of Christianity and Judaism, Old Testament, New Testament. And how many of you know that Leonard Cohen was an ordained Buddhist monk? Hands, anybody? My Zen pals know that. <laughs> so his name, to us is Leonard Jikan Cohen. Jikan was given to him by his Roshi, and Jikan means the space around silence, which is typical of Buddhist paradox, because Leonard was never silent. <laughs> so Leonard Cohen was a man of dignity, hospitality, and seductive tendencies. <laughs> Although he said that his reputation as a ladies' man was vastly overrated, but I'm gonna say I beg to differ. <laughs> <laughs> you like Leonard too? Yeah. Okay, so again, what I'm trying to do here, and I am a newbie at this, I'm trying to plant my feet and feel some energy moving up to my knees, my thighs, my hips, my shoulders, and my head. And as I wrote this, I realized that breathing is the same as dancing. Think about it. So when I heard that this was a tune by Bruce Springsteen, and honestly, I had forgotten it, my game was on. Why is that? Well, not only is Maureen from New Jersey, apparently, Bruce and I grew up in neighboring towns. He was born in Long Branch. I was born in Red Bank. Bruce is 13 days older than I am. He will be 68 years old on September 23rd. I'm going to think about Bruce now and put Leonard to the side. <laughs> okay, so 
Bruce and I were probably in football stadiums on Friday nights at the same time because our schools were longtime rivals. So imagine that. He might have been playing the guitar, I might have been making paintings, but we could have been in the same football stadium on a Friday night. So if you look at the YouTube of that wonderful piece that Kathy did, what you're going to see of Bruce, which Kathy didn't do, you're going to see Bruce wearing blue jeans, white t-shirt rolled up at the sleeves, thighs bulging, biceps bulging. Bruce is talking about carving, starving, spark, dark. <laughs> Dying for some action. This gun is for hire. <laughs> so my stories, I don't know how to do this. I dance a little differently from Bruce. Kinda kinda differently if you get that drift. And my stories are women's stories, I think. Okay. Come on, let's get that up. Come on. Come on. Get it up. Come on. That's what... You tell Bruce that, Maureen. <laughs> Okay, to my stories. Story one, Whew, 1984, Chicago, Kenmore Avenue, a two flat. It was a September night and there was an enormous moon over the lake, I think three times bigger than the moon last night. Did you see the moon? Yeah, woo! So there was a rectangle of light on the floor at the time, I had a beautiful three-year-old son, and I thought a sibling would be a really good idea. But in the 10th week of that pregnancy, I developed chicken pox. And I didn't know what varicella virus would do to that baby, 10th week. So my questions were, what will this do to my baby, and can I love this baby, no matter what. <clears throat> I had to work. I wanted to work. I wanted to paint every day. So um, think again, 1984, no home computers, no Wikipedia, no WebMD, no blogs, no internet. So for four weeks, I called doctors all over the country doctors of infectious disease. I call London, I talk to doctors in Canada. I wanted to know what is the risk to my baby. So on the sixth day of the 15th week, I decided to dance in the dark. I went to the bank and I asked the banker, the teller, for a hundred shiny copper pennies. I was wearing a nightgown that was not, it was pink, but it wasn't frothy. Not at all, it was kind of a dusty pink, kind of sad, a little hopeful. I began my ritual. I wanted to see the risk to my baby. So in that moonlight, I made a circle of 100 copper pennies. One doctor had said this baby has a 5% chance of severe mental disability, so I took out five pennies. Another doctor said this baby has a 10% chance of extreme skin abnormality. I took out 10 more pennies. But then he said, oh, maybe it's only a 3% chance of a moderate skin abnormality. <coughs> A fourth doctor, a very famous dermatologist at Northwestern, said to me, well, just have an abortion. This baby's like a wart on your back. Just take it off. I didn't know how to remove pennies 
for that. So I stood in that circle and I raised my arms and I invited every woman I knew to hold me and fold me and tell me what to do. Can I love this baby no matter what? One by one, they answered me and they said, Susan, you will love this baby no matter what. So, six weeks later, I was in the kitchen stirring pasta, doesn't matter, and I felt a gush, a splash of amniotic fluid on the kitchen floor. In 1984, there was nothing that could be done to save a 22-week baby boy named Alexander. We had an autopsy done. He did not have varicella virus. But because I danced in the dark with those women, I knew that I loved that baby no matter what. Here's what Leonard Cohen wrote. Dance me to the children who are asking to be born. Dance me through the curtains that our kisses have outworn. Raise a tent of shelter now. Though every thread is torn, dance me to the end of love. Story two. This is not a fun one either. <clears throat> August 8th, 2003. Does that ring a bell? Today is August 8th, I think. So this was my studio in River Forest. I had drawings pinned to the wall, paintings stacked to the side, and I swept my area rug of tacks and nails, and I had bare feet like I do tonight. You see, I learned that my husband, I lost my husband due to adultery, his not mine. And two of the women who had been in that circle with me that night, I lost them to adultery. Theirs, not mine. So I needed to dance in the dark. There was no moon. There was not a moon for months. There was no sun for months. And I danced that night in a blue rage. I cannot approximate that tonight. Wouldn't try. You know the color blue, cobalt blue, that's closest to the base of a flame? That's how I danced that night. I did call out to Leonard Cohen to dance with me, and I could almost feel his hands on the small of my back, but I was not listening to him that night. What I was feeling was anger, rage, grief, and sorrow. I was panicked, sweaty, lightheaded, and I danced until I fell into a pool of tears. Here's what Leonard says. Dance me to your beauty like a burning violin. Dance me through the panic till I'm gathered safely in. Lift me like an olive branch, be my homeward dove, and dance me to the end of love. I have a third short story, and the hat goes back on. <laughs> this is where my phantom lover comes in. I think you can figure who that probably <laughs> is. He's always there, ready, arms outstretched. So when Leonard dances with me in my studio, he does take off the fedora. Oh, good. Some of my friends know that I have a thing for Leonard Cohen. <laughs> if I were a younger woman, I would find a fancy PhD program and write a dissertation on Leonard G. Khan Cohen, Buddhist. You see, he was in a small cabin north of Los Angeles, and there isn't much known about 
his six years as a Buddhist monk because he was silent. So sometimes I'm my own phantom lover. I mean, let's get down to it. You and I have very little time left, really, truly, right? We don't have much time. So in that tiny speck that we have left, what I want to tell you is dial it up. <laughs> Take it to the max. Dance with a worthy partner, with a phantom lover, or by yourself. Dance as if your life depends on it, because it does. Susan Sensman. Look at me remembering names. Okay. Hang on a second. I, sometimes I have to consult the Google <laughs> to find. Uh, consult the Google. Okay. I like that. <laughs> also, this is an Android device, which I'm not. Oh. Fully. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's the uh, final <laughs> 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 